No one knows what it means, but it's provocative. No, it's not. It's it gets gross. the people it's going. Well, Hector, here's the game plan. You're gonna bring us two absolute martinis. You know how I like them, straight up. And then precisely seven and one half minutes after that, you're gonna bring us two more. Then two more after that every five minutes until one of us passes the fuck out. You got a bad attitude and you don't listen. There will be blood. It is not the violence that sets men apart. All right, it is the distance that he is prepared to go. Ever notice how you come across somebody once in a while that you shouldn't have fucked with? That's me. The fuck else would you do this job? Cocaine and hookers, my friend. Welcome to the Max Ordinate Podcast. All right, here it goes. I was going to start to talk shit. I started Max, to talk shit, and then I didn't. Max Ordinate Nation, welcome to today's episode. Jeff, how does it sound with me doing this right now? Look at you all buff and shit. It, it sounds amazing. I just want to let you know that I'm here today. My back is a little... Well, it's for all, but I'm here for it. I think all of us have just gotten used to every day something's going to be wrong with you, with your body. Fuck, I know. Jesus Christ. <laughs> all right. So today is totally unplanned, but we wanted to get our episode done. I know you got some construction happening at your house, which I think ever since I've known you, there's been some kind of construction going on in your life. So it's nothing new. But this is this is the big stretch. So this is the four months of blowing out the walls. I'm I'm out of the house. I'm living in an RV. The the front door's gone. The the back of the house is gone. They've already dug up the trenches for footing. So this is the big like fifteen hundred square foot remodel. Adding about six hundred square foot and about nine hundred foot of remodel. I don't want to put too much of your business out there. Okay. But Without giving too much information away, there is a question that I want to ask, okay? And the question is very simple. You purchased this house a couple years ago, right? It's 2023, yes. somewhere around 2021. I know it was after... It was, it was, 20, it was still in 2020 when we, when we got it. Like October, maybe-ish of 2020. Okay, so without giving away too much information... You purchased a very nice house in a very nice area in Southern California, right? And there's quite a few zeros attached to the price tag. What at what point did you say, I want to buy this house? It cost a significant amount. And then as soon as I get it, I basically want to tear it all down and I want to change all of it. Yeah. So I'll be honest, there was um, a lot of other options that fit us better, but this was the best priced house for the size of the lot. So there was a lot of houses that were pretty much already done. We could have just moved in and been fit. Not that this wasn't a nice house. It was it was nice, but it's a super nice um, house. you got to remember that I found this place and it's sitting on a half acre in the middle of of Orange County. That's true. You you have a very large parcel in an area where people don't have large parcels. Yeah, th- every house in this neighborhood is sitting on about m- at best four five thousand square foot. I mean, they're really small property, like real small lots with like fourteen fifteen hundred square foot homes. So we got real lucky in that. This wasn't like the ideal house for us, Um, but the the lot was the right size. So we always knew that we were going to have to put some money into it Um, when we got here. I just, to be fair, I sort of underestimated the amount of life disruption it was going to be. But that's all right. This is this is the last big stretch. 
after this, like I said, you know, pool's done, garage is done. So this is just the, the, the last stretch for, um, and really it's sort of symbiotic with my journey of getting where I'm at with my health. Like this should be the last, like up until January, things should be really good. So the crazy part is how much has changed over a few years, you know, yeah, for two, sure. Two to three years, like one, not just the house and how the house has changed, but how the climate around California has changed. And me and you have already talked about it. Like, dude, you're putting all this money into the house, which you know what? It's going to just grow in value, but it's almost like you're a house flipper because me and you have discussed like, man, it's almost time to leave California. I know you're, yeah. I know your significant other is not going to agree with that, but yeah. So this is, this is how we have to look at it though. I, I don't want to be in a temporary home. I don't want to live like I'm in a temporary home. Yeah. So we're just remodeling the place as if we're going to live here forever. And if we don't, then we sell it and, and we move somewhere. If we do stay here, if climate changes, then cool. Like we're good, but I don't want to be in it one foot in one foot out. If that makes sense. No, definitely not. Do you think if you ever were to move, do you think this place, like, I don't know. Personally, I don't know if it would be feasible. You would know better. Would it be worth keeping this place as a rental or would it just be too elaborate for it to be that? No, no, it'd be a great rental. And so this is what I've always, like, I got a bunch of friends and we all do. Everybody knows somebody that left California, right? Here's the problem is once you liquidate and you leave California, it's nearly impossible to come back. So it would it would not make sense for me. You don't make money selling your real estate, right? You, you make money by buying it and holding onto the shit and letting it grow in value, take loans against it, rent it, do whatever you're going to do. Um, but for me to just flip this house would make no sense. I'd pay massive amounts of taxes on it. Um, I would maybe, you know, with the remodels and everything kind of just break even. So what would make sense if I do decide to leave? Um, remember, I still have my, I, I have a, another property I used to live in before this. Um, I would just hang on to everything and, and rent them out and kind of start over in another state, uh, maybe take a second mortgage or something like that against this one. But I, I'm I'm a big believer and you don't really make money s- selling real estate. Um, you hang on to it and you create some kind of a generational wealth. I'm, but I'm, if this if, if I'm just over the state completely, I'll just flip it all and say, fuck it and end up in Arizona or Idaho. I'm just taking notes of all of your stuff so that I can follow the correct path. Whether you, I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing. I'm winging it every day. That's why I'm following. I'm, I'm closely following your path. So when I'm ready, uh, I'll be there, you know? All right. So a couple things. Um, One is our Patreon. Right, we have our VIP membership for our Patreon people. We put some different targets out there. Uh, we release things, you know, videos, training, uh, the classes that I do. I've recorded a bunch of the classes and put them on our Patreon account. So if you wanted to sign up and be a member, right now it's nine dollars a month, and it helps us fund the range. It helps us fund gear, equipment, you know, pay for Zoom and all this other shit that we have to pay monthly to get this shit going. Uh, but Jeff, Patreon has this thing where it allows us to give merchandise to our loyal customers, right? Yep. So I signed us up for this, and I've already put the designs in, uh, T-shirt, neck gaiter, coffee mug, poster, like all of these different items that I've designed. And every three months, the loyalty program member. So it's a, it's a whole new tier, right? I don't want us to like go negative putting these products out, but I do want our loyal customers to get something out of sticking with us for so long. So if they were sign up for this new tier, every three months, Patreon will send out one of these reward gifts for us. So it shows up the same time every quarter. The designs are already done for the next year. I mean, it doesn't get much easier than that, dude. No, that's pretty rad. So the 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 poster was almost you, but then the printing machine couldn't handle how badass you are. Unfortunately. I know, I know. So in other news, some of the other stuff that's been um, kind of like 
you know, I've been preparing for the Sniper Adventure Challenge for a whole year. Yeah, let's talk about how that's going. Okay. So basically from January until about June, when I went and did the Steel Safari and all that stuff, right? I was on a pretty strict lifting program. It was weightlifting, a lot of Olympic style stuff, heavy weight, low reps. Um, you know, the workouts would always change, but maybe the rep counts and stuff would change. The weight would change. But for most of it, you know, it was like the same workouts every week. And, you know, I was getting a lot stronger. I still was doing cardio, still rock climbing, doing all that stuff. Uh, but then it got to a certain point, like I came home, went and had my doctor's appointment. And we've already discussed like what different supplements that you take, what I take. And from July, right, when I was home for Steel Safari and I came back, we did some training, stuff like that. My body weight was around 155, which is fine. Like I was stronger from all of the weightlifting we were doing. I wasn't gaining a lot of weight. Um, and my goal weight for Sniper Adventure Challenge coming up in November is 148, 147-ish, right? I want to trim down. I don't want to carry extra weight. So in July, I get my prescription to start TRT. And along with TRT, the doctor has me taking this supplement called DHEA. Uh, as well as a thyroid medication to help my body process some of these hormones and things like that. It is now August, approximately a month and a half that I've been on this TRT cycle. Jeff, I went from 155 pounds to 170, and I'm freaking out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm going the wrong direction. <laughs> Trim down, fat boy. And the weird part is like all of my clothes still fit, right? Like yeah. I, my waist hasn't gotten any bigger. My pants still fit except for my thighs, my ass, my chest, my shoulders. Like all of these have, have grown and it's, you know, I don't think I've put on 15 pounds of muscle in a month and a half. I don't think that's realistic, but I, th I do think I'm retaining more water and on top of the water retention, you have some muscle build in there, right? You have these hormones that are, you know, after how many years of having a low testosterone level, now my levels are, you know, my body's going through a transition. Yeah, so for sure. Some, there's some inflammation that's happening as, as I get used to this new stuff. Um, but so I'm sitting here and I'm talking with my, my trainer. I'm like, we're going the wrong direction. Like, I'm still doing cardio, but dude, I'm, you know, I was keeping seven minute mile paces running two to three miles every morning before my workout. And mm -hmm. now like, I'm just not used to this extra 15 pounds. So I'll be running in the morning and it's like struggling to keep an eight and a half minute pace just because I feel so much heavier. And I'm like, something's got to change. And then talking with the trainer what's your diet? I'm like, I don't know. I fucking eat whatever I want. Like, it's not bad, but it ain't great, you know? And the water weight, stuff like that, just dealing with all of it. So the workouts have changed now, um, partially because of my little freak out of like, why am I gaining so much weight? We need to stop powerlifting. We need to stop doing everything that we're doing because we're going the wrong way, right? By the time S Sniper Adventure Challenge gets here, I feel like I'll be a 200 pounds and it's not going to be good fair, fair enough to be worried so we have basically two and a half months until sniper adventure challenge to trim down maintain strength and change the workouts so the workouts have been altered i'm going to uh pull up pull up what the workouts kind of look like right now but have you done crossfit before uh, I did CrossFit for two days and I went, nope. <laughs> okay. So I, I've only dabbled in like CrossFit and, you know, when I was in the military, they had some versions of different CrossFit coming out. Um, you know, it's fine. Like I've never done it to this level and I haven't done it in so long that I kind of forgot just how pain in the ass it is. 
So I'm going to share with you what my workouts look like. And this is just the past week. So this is the first, like, when I got told we're transitioning from powerlifting to these endurance CrossFit style high intensity workouts, I'm like, okay, so this is the first one. And it was called three minutes on, one minute off. So you got three minutes of work and you got one minute off. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. So you start with rowing 500 meters. And I get told you want to keep a pace around a minute 30. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, it's been so long since I've been on a row machine. I thought like, sure, yeah, minute and a half pace. Got it. So I get on the row machine, dude, and I'm I'm starting to row, and I get down to like a minute 39, dude, and I'm gassed. After 100 meters, I'm like, how the fuck am I going to do a minute and 30 pace for 500 meters? Some of it's in my technique. Like, I really need to work on my row technique, uh, using your legs and just yeah. having that right motion, right? But a minute 30 was not happening, like... And I'm trying to look up after the workout, I'm looking up like how, what is the average pace for like an elite athlete, an average above average, you know, how do I, Hey Google, how do I row better? How do I compare to everybody else? You know, but a minute 30 was not happening for me. The best I was able to maintain was about mid one forties. And that was, that was soul crushing by itself. So you row 500 meters and then you have goblet squats, right? So you're just doing goblet squats with a 45 pound kettlebell until that three minutes is up. And then you go back, you row, and then you do push ups until that three minutes is up. And then row and then V ups. You know what V ups are? Yes. Those can be rough, dude. Woo. And then mountain climbers. And then you just re I think I forgot one round of something in here. It's all good. Um, but anyways, you have five rounds of this and then you just repeat. So ultimately you're rowing 5,000 meters as fast as you can. And you're doing these workouts in between the row sessions. So that was pretty rough, dude. The next workout, as many rounds as possible in 15 minutes, hanging from the pull-up bar, toes to bar, 12 thrusters with, uh, I believe it was 115 pounds and I halfway through the workout had to reduce the weight just so I could not take as many breaks in between the thrusters and then nine pull-ups and then he rests for five minutes which for me was laying on my back on the concrete like praying that I will survive this <laughs> and then seven minutes of 15 mountain climbers 12 box jumps and nine push-ups so I obviously survived this workout but dude these are no these are no joke man like no, it doesn't look fun. Stomped here. Uh, I did this one yesterday. So this one was row 250 and then 10 push ups, 15 box jumps, 20 V ups, and then row 500, repeat the, the workout, and then row 1000. Um, you know, like the first two, I was trying to go as fast as I could, but for the 1000 and 1500, it's insane if, you, if you're trying to keep a minute 40 pace for 1500 meters of rowing. Like, dude, I, I have mad props for these dudes out there doing these high intensity workouts. You know, I'm just, my body's not used to this and it's a huge transition for me to just jump into this and think that like, oh, I'm an elite, you know, fucking specimen. Yeah. Let me show you how fucking elite you are real quick. So are you, have you cut out? all the Olympic lifting all together and you're just doing a, a CrossFit CrossFit style, like high intensity workout for now. Yeah. So I'm still running in the morning. Um, you know, like twice a week I'll ride my bike to work and then, uh, and then I have their CrossFit workout, you know, when I get to work and, and I go to the gym before we hit the office. So, you know, uh, climbing on the weekends, diving, swimming, you know, I try to, try to continue doing what i was doing but the actual gym portion is now just transitioned to the high intensity stuff so it, it has been an experience but then you look at you know i posted a few pictures wanting to just 
kind of share what my diet looks like. And I'm going to show you right now. This is, it's kind of bland. Uh, 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 hold on, wrong screen. But did you see the picture that I posted up? I, I, I think so. So the, the picture I posted up was like vegetables and can you see the screen? Nope. What in the yeah. heck? I got two black screens. Man, things are not going my way right now. So I posted the uh, the picture of some veggies, a hard-boiled egg, and some egg whites. And uh, <laughs> somebody commented like, that's a nasty-looking breakfast. And I'm like, I didn't have a choice in this matter. I was kind of given what I've been given. Um, so the diet, right? And I can't get it to pull up right now. But what it is is like can trying to trying to control how much protein and carbs I'm taking in, eliminating uh, non-essential sugars. Mm -hmm. So in the morning, protein shake, twenty five grams of protein, and then my nine o'clock in the morning breakfast is two hard boiled eggs, a quarter cup of egg whites, and a cup of vegetables. It could be you know green peppers, squash, cucumbers, like. That's what I got. And Still then, seems like a lot of protein. Am I crazy? What? That three eggs in the morning doesn't seem like a lot of. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. I honestly, I'm still trying to understand this diet completely myself. So I'm not really entirely sure. Right. But that is when, when you're done eating, you're sitting there like, is that it? Like, where's the rest of it? You know? 12 or sorry, 12 p.m. right around noon. It's my second meal, which is three ounces of ground beef and one cup of brown rice with a cup of vegetables. Like that's it. Okay, okay. cool. Got it, right? It's not a lot of beef. I think we're all used to eating a little bit more than that, but this is portion control, right? And it's 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 transitioning you from eating larger traditional three meals a day to smaller five meals a day mm -hmm. so that same meal is being eaten at uh, 4 p.m now i can substitute brown rice for whole wheat pasta uh, which i have been doing just to try and change it up a little bit 6 p.m it's a three ounce piece of chicken and vegetables and then right before bed is a uh, what is it it's a scoop of peanut butter like a tablespoon okay. and a uh, cup of yogurt and that's it so that is a... and you eat that right before you go to bed yeah so this is the same meal every day i mean i just started changing hot sauces that i put into the ground beef to change the flavor like one day it might be tapatio one day you know it might be tabasco you know whatever but every day it's the same. Thing. And but you can also swap out your protein. You can swap out your carbs. Like I I had a I used to have a similar diet um when I was training pretty hard and I had, you know, it was just like a rotation of of some staples um that I would just it was the same basic meal but just substitutions a couple times a week for different things just so it didn't get too boring. But I'm like you, like I don't I can eat that that diet and I'd be perfectly content. I just eat to fill a void. I don't eat for pleasure. I don't eat for fun. I just eat whatever's in front of me. So if the hardest part is preparing it and, <laughs> and getting, getting it. So you're not just grabbing something, right? Meal prep is always the biggest thing. Um, but I, I mean, that's an, that's an easy meal for me. Cause it's like, cool, three things, eat it. And I just go about my day. Whereas now we've got the kids, the wife meal prep is so different. It's hard for me to, to, to manage a diet like that it's definitely we're the same like you know sure there are foods that taste good right but yeah of course really like i just don't care i feel like i have more important things to do than worry about the food exactly and you know once the meal prep is done you know and because of the beef and the chicken like i can't prepare the whole week's meals on a sunday 
Like mm-hmm. this stuff just won't last that long and be and be good. Uh, so I got a meal prep twice a week, but it's nice when you wake up on like Tuesday morning and you could just reach in, grab your three meals that are already prepared and get out the door, you know, like your stuff for the day is done. So yeah, I do. I also one one thing that you said though, that I think I used to was in my diet too, is a lot of people they used to fight me on this. You're the only other person I heard say this, which is eating something right before you go to bed. So I had a, a I always had a meal, like it, whether it was almond butter or sometimes it was popcorn. There was there was a certain couple things I could eat right before I went to bed. And that was part of the diet plan. I had to eat before I went to bed. You know, and it's interesting because you read a lot of things and people like bunches of things on the internet will tell you like, don't eat before bed, you know, three hours or something like that. Uh, mm-hmm. so just following this diet because you can disagree with whatever diet it is, but until you give it a fair shake, how do you know it's doing what it's supposed to do? So For sure. I'm just following what it says and eating this yogurt and this scoop of peanut butter before bed. And I'm still waking up in the morning and like, fuck, I'm so hungry. Like whatever its purpose is, maybe it's to continually keep your body moving while you're sleeping. Whatever it's supposed to do, it's it's probably doing it because I'm still waking up insanely hungry. So, well, fingers crossed, you can drop some weight, fat boy, because oh, 170 is not going to work for you for Sniper Adventure Challenge. <laughs> calm down, calm down. Let's not talk about it, okay? <laughs> so, uh, we are not well, going to beat a dead horse on these targets that we put out. We had awesome discussion. I released the targets and said, "This is what Max Warnett is doing." for the law enforcement wall, take it or leave it. We have our small target box center of the face. And then we have our larger box, which encompasses more of the cranial vault. And we ran with it, right? There's Mm -hmm. so many different opinions out there. And I had a buddy who listened to the, to the podcast. He reached out to me and he says, Hey, Love the episode. I thought you brought up good points. I thought Jeff brought up good points. He's like, you know, ultimately like, and it came back to what you said, which I thought was really cool because I have heard this before. And we actually, we train to that standard depending on what department that you're working with. Right. But take LA Sheriff's, for example, when I first mm-hmm. met them in 2014 and we began training together, they would be on target and they'd say, you know, the spotter would say quarter of the target. And I'm like, what are you, what are you saying? Why are you saying that? And they're like, Oh, quarter of the target, like even quarters all around your aiming point. And I'm like, okay, it makes sense. Yep. Not heard that in the Marine sniper realm, but what you're saying makes sense. And my buddy reminded me of this. He's like, ultimately dude, just quarter the target and let her rip. And I'm like, that makes so much sense to get back to that mindset when it doesn't matter what direction that head is facing you. He could be looking straight at you. He could be sideways, quarter the target and take your shot. Right. Which doesn't put you in the cranial vault, but ultimately like, you know, a friend of mine who's a gunner said, ultimately when you put that round in somebody's bread basket, you know, most of the time that shot ain't going to buff, you know, there's no coming back from that. So I like where we went with the law enforcement stuff. We got a, you know, we got a, a roughly two and a half by two inch triangular shaped quad triangle, whatever people want to call it. I know it's not a true triangle. And then you have the cranial vault that still allows you to get those impact points. And I'm happy where the target's at. I think we accomplished what we wanted with it while also taking other people's advice in there. Now, I'm going to throw this up there. All right. This is the military version, Jeff. Can you see it? I did. I saw that this morning. All right. So what I've done with the military version is we still have that outer kill box, right? I've reduced the size of the inner triangular portion a little bit just because I do want the military guys to have to fight to reach that perfect score, right? It shouldn't be so easy that they can just, 
you know, lay down and, and get a hundred percent. Like, I don't want it to be that way. Like you need to be 100% skilled shooter to make this happen, but you still have that outer region where you're going to pass the qual if you're a halfway decent guy, right? We lowered the outer kill zone because as a military member, if you're fighting a near peer or a peer peer adversary, you know, we're not in Iraq and Afghanistan fighting insurgents anymore. We're prepping for future battles that could be held against China or, you know, Russia or anybody, any one of these, you know, countries. And what are they all going to be wearing when you think about near peer adversaries? We're wearing helmets. Helmets, body armor, right? And that's stuff that you got to think about. So when you look at just the CQT, like close quarters tactics, everybody's aiming to shoot for the chest, like bam, center mass, like bam, bam. What are a lot of people going to be wearing there? Exactly. So, you know, like even on the close quarters guys, they're having to think about aiming points and like where to engage these targets when you're fighting peer peer adversaries all right and it's the same thing when you're talking about headshots and snipers like you got this cranial cover and you know a lot of people are like oh well it's not bulletproof no it's not bulletproof but it still can alter the trajectory of the round if you don't place it perfectly to where that person is going to live you know mm -hmm. when i was in iraq in 2005 we were in a humvee and the guy up in the up in the gunner seat de La Rosa, like the our TTP at the time was he had to sit just eye level with the top of the Humvee so that the metal shroud around the gun turret could give him as much protection as possible from the sniper threat. And they still snuck around in one of the gaps and shot him in the top of the helmet. Now it hit the top of the helmet and, and it fucking ricocheted out, but the inside of the helmet blew inward and still fucked him up a little bit. Right. Yeah, I bet. But the helmet did what it's supposed to do. He ain't dead. You know, like he's still walking around today. So, you know, you got to think about those types of things when you're dealing with future wars and stuff like that. So it's interesting to try and take these targets and realize that you can't just have a one target fits everything in every bucket, and, right? And then, you know, there's another a complete different component, which uh, my buddy brought up to me. And he said, said, you got a second to chat while I enjoy a triple Belgium? I said, send it. And he he brought up some very good points, which we've discussed before, but not really at length, which is the 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 weird crossover we have, but the separate missions and the potential for issues between civilian law enforcement and military training. Yeah. So one of the things that I, I sort of something I said that I, I probably in with my background, I probably shouldn't have even said, but which is one of the things for, for law enforcement, we have to remember that we make sure is we are not trying to kill anybody. We have, I think it's AB 392, which is the uh, peace officers use, use of force standards, yeah. simply trying to stop a threat. Correct. In that scenario, you have standards which are to simply stop the immediate threat that doesn't mean that doesn't that what by whatever level of incapacitation so there's a there's other components within each individual sector civilian military and, and law enforcement that we also have to be mindful of um and so that's a whole other discussion i think i i touched on it we i wanted to talk about i wanted to do bring up i wanted to write some some briefs on it and talk about it next week but that's a whole nother thing that stemmed from just this target which i loved just this target that you created created so much discussion um on on other subjects i guess that i had i wasn't expecting when you when you think about all the stuff that came up with just this target right but it not just this target but you think as as a whole we are a training company. Uh, I also contract for the military, right? But ultimately, like any drill that you come up with, any target that you come up with, there's got to be a realization 
that that drill needs to fulfill a gap that you're trying to enhance right mm -hmm. like very rarely do you find like a training exercise or a training drill that's going to cover every aspect of what your intent or your goal is you know like we have this target and the purpose of this target is to do this right or you know like there's a drill i'm working on right now for the urban sniper course where on one day we're going to have the snipers in their position they're going to be in their urban hide sites and they're going to be given m4 sesam rifles you know what sesams are the paintball mm -hmm. rounds oh yeah so they'll be given these rifles and then we're going to have role players out in the town and they will also have these rifles right and basically what's going to happen is that they're going to take their shot on this high value target or this this commander like whatever the mission is they're going to take this shot and now they're compromised and they have to use the plan that they put in place, whether they're repelling out of the building, they're going to exfil out of a certain door, like whatever their plan was, they're going to have to execute it because now they're being pursued. So it's an active breakout where they can be engaged with a force that has the ability to actually shoot at them with paintball rounds, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm briefing this whole plan. I'm like, I want them to be in a situation where they're, their plan, their egress, their escape and evade plan, like all of this stuff is going to be put to the test. Their early warning devices, their booby traps, like whatever they put out will be put to the test. And somebody comes back to me is like, well, they're going to be using these paintball M4s. It's not going to be their issued rifle. Do you like, is that going to be a problem? And I'm like, no, it's not going to be a problem. The intent is that they're not, you know, that we don't intend for them to use these rifles because we want them to be proficient with their own weapons. The intent behind this exercise is I want them to know how their plan passed or failed based on how they set it up. They're legitimately trying to get out of their position and save their own lives, mm -hmm. right? That's the intent. So ultimately, I don't care what rifles they're using. It doesn't matter, right? So you have to look at every training aspect of it and say, what's the intent? And am I fulfilling that, that space? And I think that's with everything, right? You can have a target that is a human head and, you know, people can look at it and say, well, like, well, we're training cops to shoot people in the head. And it's like for this particular exercise. Yes, we are. But then another exercise that we have, it may be decision-making where like shoot, don't shoot. Does this individual meet? the criteria for use of force. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so and and I think we've talked about this before, right? We've looked at other training, pistol shooting, carbine shooting, and we've said, what's the purpose of this training? What's the end goal and what specific skill set are you trying to train? Cause you're not other than just pulling a trigger. Right. And we actually broke down like one of Amir's uh, um, drills and we picked out what the end goal was. So with every, target we make with every drill that we do we just have to think what's the end goal absolutely and that's with everything you know and a lot of times we'll see other trainers other training companies on social media who post these videos up and that's the first thing we ask ourselves when we're chatting is like what's the purpose of this drill like what are the good habits that it's breeding what are the skill sets it's building and are there any bad habits that it's forcing that shooter to do you know and that there's that one drill i showed you and i believe next week we're going to have him on the podcast and we'll be able to talk about it it's not his drill he's running somebody else's drill and what it is is a, it's a ladder and he's shooting at this three by five index card at like 100 meters 100 yards and he's got to shoot two rounds from every step so low step two shots and then he moves up moves up moves up and then back down so I think in the end, he's shooting somewhere around 20 rounds or something like that, like five positions, two shots each going up, two shots each going back down. But he's moving as fast as he can. And his positions don't look horrible, but that was my first question. I even commented on his post. I'm like, 
what's the purpose of this drill and what was the target like how how big was your target what were you trying to do because i want to know like all i can see right now is it looks like you're moving faster than you can shoot accurately so tell me what the point is behind this drill like that's what i want to know so he's we're going to get him on the podcast we're going to be able to pick his brain and kind of see like where the where the positives are and if there's any downsides and what to look out for yeah and i i think that i'd like to i guess it just brings up a maybe not brings up a point when we pose those questions when we're breaking something down where we're looking at people's videos and asking hey like what's the point of this what are you doing let me see your target it's not necessarily because we're just trying to like motherfuck somebody's drill or talk shit about them generally trying to say what's the training purpose and what's the benefit because if if I can learn from you, even if like everybody's training and there's tons of people out there doing really good shit that I may not understand. Ultimately, I just want to get better. I want my training to get better. I want the stuff that I teach to be better. And the only way to do that is to ask questions of other people doing this and to rule out whether their shit's any good or not. So a lot of people get offended. Look, I, you know, people all the time when both me and you ask like, well, look, let's break this video down. Or I said, what the fuck are you doing? Well, why are you shooting such a big target? It's not just generally just calling them out. It's saying, hey, tell me the purpose behind this so I can see if this has relevance in how I do my training or my instruction. Yeah. And, you know, if you're an instructor, if you're a trainer, or it, even if you're just a regular Joe, like if you're executing this drill, you should know what those answers are. Right. Or then it does start this, you know, like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, yeah. We didn't it, intend to uh, bash you, but now that's what it's turned into because you don't know the answers to things that you should know. So, in, in that we always, I always bring this back to golf. Relevance of training, you know, we talk about every drill has a specific thing it's supposed to be training, right? Same thing with golf. If if I'm doing freezers where I'm taking the club back and I'm pausing and then I'm swinging, or if I'm half my feet together, I'm doing strep step drills where I take the club back and then I take a step and then I swing. Those are teaching specific movements or body positions. It doesn't mean that's how I'm swinging the golf club when I'm playing. Yeah. Same thing with our training. Everything we do is going to be teaching a very small specific skill set of the marksmanship as a whole, but it doesn't mean that's how we're doing. That's, that's not the entire process. This is just one piece of it. We're trying to hone in on. Yeah, 100%, man. Well, Jeff, that is the episode for today. Um, I know that you got a lot of construction going on. i trying to put together another episode for this week. Whether or not your schedule will allow that will is yet to be seen. But we, should be, to, we should be able to knock one out Friday. I think my Friday is pretty, pretty well open. Um, I, I do have, again, I got some stuff I want to chat about. Also, some more off-topic stuff. So, uh, let's try to put a, a a podcast together on Friday. Absolutely, I appreciate your time, everybody else. Thanks for listening. We appreciate you guys. The numbers are just skyrocketing in terms of podcast listens, YouTube views. If you haven't been to our YouTube channel, go check it out. Uh, Jeff, I am not sure why people can't subscribe. Every box has been checked the right way, and it's just not working. So, anyways, are you still there? You're frozen again. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, right. There you go. Now you're frozen. Hey, buddy. I appreciate you. I'll chat with you later. Everybody else, this is Tyler and Jeff, and we're out of here. Hey.